High yield is a fairly abstract concept, and I wondered what it meant at the level of the plant. More cobs per stop? More kernels per cob? Neither of the above, Naylor explained. The higher yield of modern hybrids stems mainly from the fact that they can be planted so close together. 30,000 to the acre instead of 8,000 in his father's day. Planting the old open-pollinated, non-hybrid varieties so densely would result in stalks grown spindly as they jostle each other for sunlight. Eventually the plants topple in the wind. Hybrids have been bred for thicker stalks and stronger root systems, the better to stand upright in a crowd and withstand mechanical harvesting. Basically, modern hybrids can tolerate the corn equivalent of city life, growing amid the multitudes without succumbing to urban stress. You would think that competition among individuals would threaten the tranquility of such a crowded metropolis, yet the modern field of corn forms a most orderly mob. This is because every plant in it, being an F1 hybrid, is genetically identical to every other. Since no individual plant has inherited any competitive edge over any other, precious resources like sunlight, water, and soil nutrients are shared equitably. There are no alpha corn plants to hog the light or fertilizer. The true socialist utopia turns out to be a field of F1 hybrid plants. Iowa begins to look a little different when you think of its sprawling fields as cities of corn. The land, in its own way, settled as densely as Manhattan for the very same purpose, to maximize real estate values. There may be a little pavement, but this is no middle landscape. Though by any reasonable definition Iowa is a rural state, it is more thoroughly developed than many cities. A mere 2% of the state's land remains what it used to be tall grass prairie, every square foot of the rest having been completely remade by man. The only thing missing from this man-made landscape is man. Vanishing species. A case can be made that the corn plant's population explosion in places like Iowa is responsible for pushing out not only other plants, but the animals and then finally the people too. When Naylor's grandfather arrived in America, the population of Greene County was near its peak, 16,467 people. In the most recent census, it had fallen to 10,366. There are many reasons for the depopulation of the American Farm Belt, but the triumph of corn deserves a large share of the blame, or the credit, depending on your point of view. When George Naylor's grandfather was farming, the typical Iowa farm was home to whole families of different plant and animal species, corn being only the fourth most common. Horses were the first, because every farm needed working animals. There were only 225 tractors in all of America in 1920, followed by cattle, chickens, and then corn. After corn came hogs, apples, hay, oats, potatoes, and cherries. Many Iowa farms also grew wheat, plums, grapes, and pears. This diversity allowed the farm not only to substantially feed itself, and by that I don't mean feed the farmers, but also the soil and the livestock, but to withstand a collapse in the market for any one of those crops. It also produced a completely different landscape than the Iowa of today. You had fences everywhere, George recalled, and of course pastures. Everyone had livestock, so large parts of the farm would be green most of the year. The ground never used to be this bare this long. For much of the year, from the October harvest to the emergence of the corn in mid-May, Green County is black now, a great tarmac only slightly more hospitable to wildlife than asphalt. Even in May, the only green you see are the moats of lawn surrounding the houses, the narrow strips of grass dividing one farm from another, and the roadside ditches. The fences were pulled up when the animals left, beginning in the 50s and 60s, or when they moved indoors, as Iowa's hogs have more recently. Hogs now spend their lives in aluminum sheds perched atop manure pits. 
Greene County in the spring has become a monotonous landscape. Vast, plowed fields relieved only by a dwindling number of farmsteads. Increasingly lonesome islands of white wood and green grass marooned in a sea of black. Without the fences and hedgerows to slow it down, Naylor says, the winds blow more fiercely in Iowa today than they once did. Corn isn't solely responsible for remaking this landscape. It was the tractor, after all, that put the horses out of work, and with the horses went the fields of oats and some of the pasture. But corn was the crop that put cash in the farmer's pocket. So as corn yields began to soar at mid-century, the temptation was to give the miracle crop more and more land. Of course, every other farmer in America was thinking the same way, having been encouraged to do so by government policies, with the inevitable result that the price of corn declined. One might think falling corn prices would lead farmers to plant less of it, but the economics and psychology of agriculture are such that exactly the opposite happened. Beginning in the 50s and 60s, the flood tide of cheap corn made it profitable to fatten cattle on feedlots instead of on grass, and to raise chickens in giant factories rather than in farmyards. Iowa farmers couldn't compete with the factory-farmed animals their own cheap corn had helped spawn, so the chickens and cattle disappeared from the farm, and with them the pastures and hayfields and fences. In their place, the farmers planted more of the one crop they could grow more of than anything else, corn. And whenever the price of corn slipped, they planted a little more of it to cover expenses and stay even. By the 1980s, the diversified family farm was history in Iowa, and corn was king. Planting corn on the same ground year after year brought down the predictable plagues of insects and disease. So beginning in the 1970s, Iowa farmers began to alternate corn with soybeans, a legume. Recently, though, bean prices having fallen and bean diseases having risen, some farmers are going back to a risky rotation of corn on corn. With the help of its human and botanical allies, that is, farm policy and soybeans, corn had pushed the animals and their feed crops off the land and steadily expanded into their paddocks and pastures and fields. Now it proceeded to push out the people. For the radically simplified farm of corn and soybeans doesn't require nearly as much human labor as the old diversified farm, especially when the farmer can call on 16 row planters and chemical weed killers. One man can handle a lot more acreage by himself when it's planted in monoculture, and without animals to care for, he can take the weekend off and even think about spending the winter in Florida. Growing corn is just riding tractors and spraying, Naylor said. The number of riding and spraying days it takes to raise 500 acres of industrial corn can probably be counted in weeks. So the farms got bigger, and eventually the people, who the steadily falling price of corn could no longer support anyway, went elsewhere, seeding the field to the monstrous grass.